Welcome to Worship Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. A few announcements for you before we get into our next song. Uh, one is that we have communion services this Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, 9.15, and 10.30. You can sign up for those on our church website before coming to them. It's good for us to know how many are coming so that we can be prepared. And uh, you can do that at www.stjohnlc. That's S-T-J-O-H-N lc.com. Also on our church website, you can find information about a couple service opportunities we have very soon. Food Fresh with Clark County Food Bank will be back uh, in September with uh, our, our opportunity to serve our neighbors with fresh produce. And also Family Promise, our week with Family Promise is coming up soon. And we have an opportunity for you to sign up for uh, donating your time as an evening monitor, uh, providing help with meals, or uh, an overnight monitor. That's really where our biggest need is, is for people to sign up and stay overnight. This will be not at our location, but at a church in Battleground. And uh, hope that you'll consider blessing uh, families in need in that way. Uh, we also want to make sure that you know that we still have a set of keys that was left at David's installation service. And so if you're missing car keys, we've got them. Uh, call the church office and hopefully we can uh, get those back into your hands. All right, that's all by way of announcements. I want to introduce our opening hymn. It's Praise to You and Adoration. Let's sing. Oh, my God. 
Remember God's grace to us when he chose us in holy baptism and brought us into his family through washing away of our sin, washing of water and the word. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom to know is everlasting life, grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may boldly confess him to be the Christ and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Bible readings for this Sunday are uh, from Isaiah and from Romans, and then a gospel lesson from Matthew. We're going to give you an opportunity for the first two readings to find a Bible and read this aloud in your homes. If you're on your own, I still suggest reading it out loud. It's good for your ears. Faith comes by hearing, the scriptures say. And if you're with others in your home, then I invite you to have someone read this scripture lesson for everybody there. And uh, we're going to turn first to the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 51. This is going to serve as our sermon text today. So verses 1 through 6, I'll let you pause the video and take time to read it now. And now it's time for us to read our epistle lesson for the day from the epistle or letter of St. Paul to the church in Rome. We'll read chapter 11, verse 33 through chapter 12, verse 8. I'll let you pause the video and read in your homes. Thank you for reading the word from your homes. Now we get an opportunity to read the gospel together. I invite you from wherever you are to rise to your feet as a symbol that you've been lifted up as sons of God. And you can stand in the presence of our Lord because of Jesus, God's son, who has been an elder brother to you and invited you into his family. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We take time now to humble ourselves before our Lord. He is gracious and merciful to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So we openly confess our sins before him that he might take that burden from us and give us his easy yoke to walk with him and experience his goodness. might become his righteousness humble himself and carry the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah
Lord, my life this week was a testimony to my willfulness. I sinned in thoughts, words, and actions. I did not reflect your power in my life. I forgot about the debt you paid for me, the blood that was shed. My selfishness and thoughtlessness consumed me. I even turned from opportunities to show or speak your love to others. Remind me of those moments that I might heartily repent of them here and now. Draw me back into a close relationship with you, my rock and my redeemer. came to give us God's perfect forgiveness and perfect forgetfulness. When Jesus ministered among us, he gave authority to his church to loose on earth what heaven would loose and to bind on earth those things which heaven would bind. What that means is that he's given authority for disciples to forgive the sins of people here in his place on his behalf. And so on behalf of Jesus, as a called and ordained servant of the word, and upon your confession, I announce God's grace to you, and I loose you. I forgive you of those sins that had bound you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Through Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven, and it is wonderfully forgotten by God. He will remember your sins. Affirmation of faith today comes from Luther's explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed. We're going to confess that part of the creed. We're going to confess uh, what Luther wrote about it in the small catechism. So the week, this week we examine the third article of the Apostles' Creed. Let's speak it together. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, 
enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith, in the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christ Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all of my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. We now take time to whisk away to the gym, to Koinonia Hall, where we meet David for our children's lesson. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to church. Uh, so glad to have you here. I have a question for you. Who are you? Take a second and think about it and answer that question. Who are you? Typically, when someone asks us that, we respond with our name. Someone would say, who are you? I'd say, oh, my name is David. I'm David, that's who I am. Sometimes we'll also put a title before that, like I might say, I'm DCE David. That kind of tells you my name, but it also tells you a little bit about me and, and what I do. Some of us uh, have multiple names that we go by. Uh, for example, sometimes I am known as Smooth Dave. It's a personal favorite of mine. Still other people sometimes call me the Sniff Hip Whiz Kid. Now, I'm not really sure what that one means, but it sounds cool, so we stick with it. Occasionally, I'm referred to as Long-Legged Dave, which I guess makes sense. I am fairly tall. Sometimes, people call me James. James is my traveling name. If I'm going on an adventure or a road trip, I go by James. Still others call me That Crazy Couve Kid, and that pretty much tells you all you need to know right there. Other people, and I'm looking at you, Mara, refer to me as Sassy Dave. I guess sometimes that one is true, if I'm being honest. And finally, my favorite, saving the best for last, is the Dashing Door Holder. Now notice with all these names, they tell you a little bit, somewhat jokingly, but a little bit about who I am. And you may be thinking, wow, that's a lot of names for one dude, which is fair. But you know who has even more names than that? Take a guess. Yeah, it's God. When you read through the Old and New Testaments, you find all sorts of names and titles that the authors give to God. Here in church, we have this really amazing tapestry here that has all sorts of names that you can find in the Bible that refer to God. We have names and titles like Root of David, Author of Life, Anointed One, King of the Jews, Most High, Messiah, cornerstone. All of these are names and titles that mean something, and they tell us about who God is. In our gospel reading today, Jesus asks Peter a really similar question to what I asked you at the beginning of this. Jesus says, Peter, who do you say I am? In other words, Peter, who am I? And Peter responds by saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, what does Christ mean? Well, it's up here. You can't probably see it, but anointed one. Christ means anointed one. To be anointed is to be set apart for a special purpose. And in the Old Testament, there were typically two groups of people who were anointed. Sometimes it would be priests, people who interceded, uh, spoke to God on behalf of the people. And the other was a king. Kings were anointed. They were set apart for the specific purpose of ruling and caring for people. In our gospel lesson, when Peter says, you are the Christ, he's recognizing that Jesus is the anointed king, the king who is set apart and promised to come and bring his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, here to earth. And what's even more amazing about all that is that that king gave his life for his people. You see, Jesus, the anointed one, the Christ, saw you as valuable, as loved, and as treasured, that he gave his life so that all the bad things that you've done, all those sins and mistakes could be forgiven. And that through him, you would be able to know God and to have a relationship with him. How many other kings do you know would set aside all the glory, all the wealth, all the power and praise that comes with being a king to become a servant and to die for their people? Well, I don't know of many besides Jesus who'd be willing to do that. 
But what a wonderful thing to know that the king of the universe, the living God, sees you as precious and valuable. That he gave his life so that you could be forgiven and you could be bought back into a relationship with him. Christ is a pretty amazing name. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you gave on the cross to forgive our sins. We thank you for being a good and perfect king who loves us so much that you entered this world to prove that love, to show that love, and to bring us back to you. We thank you for your forgiveness and the grace that you pour out on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys, and thanks for tuning in. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's theme, a chip off the old block, comes out of our Old Testament reading from Isaiah chip, chapter 51, where the Lord's prophet gives a word of hope for a future people. The prophet Isaiah is going to minister to a people who will live about 150 years after his ministry and will go through a terrible time of exile in a foreign empire called Babylonia. And they are people who are going to need a shot of hope to live through their days of exile away from their homeland and away from everything that looks familiar to them. They will need, the thing, need to know that things are going to turn around and get better for future generations. They will need to know the God of hope. And so Isaiah prophesies to them. I want to be candid with you for a moment and talk about a struggle that I've been having recently. And maybe, maybe you've been feeling a similar struggle. I've been struggling with hopelessness. Now, I have hope, ultimate hope, the best kind of hope. I have hope in the resurrection and the life of the world to come. I have hope in my Savior, Jesus, who has already risen from the dead and is going to raise the dead upon his appearance on the last day when he comes back to judge the living and the dead. I believe that in Jesus Christ, the dead will rise, and if I'm one of them by that time, then I'll get to live with Jesus. And if I'm still living by the coming of Christ, then I too will be glorified with those who are being raised. I have hope in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That's ultimate hope, and Jesus gives that to me and to you for all who have faith in him. That said, I do struggle with hopelessness about a lot of the things that we're going through right now as a church, as a culture, as a community. I struggle when it comes to hope because I look at the fact that we're a church that doesn't get to come together in a way that looks familiar. I, I know we have worship services in the gym on Sunday mornings, and I invite you to come and take part in that. Take part in Jesus at his table. We get to have communion. We get to have Christian community with each other as well. But, you know, it's not the same, and I get it. And I'm glad that we have an opportunity to come to you in your living rooms with worship and preaching ministry. I'm glad that we get to find you wherever you are. It's actually a vehicle that is one we should have been doing a long time ago. I'm glad we've discovered it, but it's not the same. Quite frankly, I'm sick of preaching to a camera. <laughs> I know you're behind there someplace, but I don't get to see you. It'd be nice to have this look a little more familiar. And not just regarding church. I mean, we're in the middle of an election cycle right now, and I'm starting to see the character of our country come alive. You know, it's not just the rioters who are out there in the streets causing all kinds of mayhem and rebelling against every authority they can possibly find. I mean, that's bad enough, but now I see our leaders tearing each other apart on TV. It's nothing new, I realize, but I just hear more of it, and I have a hard time switching it off. I should learn something from that. I have a hard time when it comes to hopelessness, when I think about our schools. Are we going to get the kids and teachers back into the classrooms anytime this school year? I don't see an end in sight, and maybe you don't either. I have a hard time when it comes to hopelessness, when I think about even my family. Not to tell stories out of school or out of the parsonage, but our family unit has struggled. I'm sure we're not alone in that. We've struggled putting others first instead of ourselves. We've struggled finding kindness and love towards other family members in our four walls. 
we've, we've struggled getting along. We have our moments, but we have our moments. We struggle forgiving and letting go of the past. We struggle loosing each other from our sins. Instead, we'd rather bind each other to them. We struggle. I struggle with hopelessness. When's it going to get better? Is it ever? And to that, the Lord's prophet speaks. To the exiles in Babylonia, and to those of us who are living in a bit of an exile today, the Lord's prophet says, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. Abraham was but one. He was one man, and he was an old one at that. His wife Sarah wasn't a whole lot younger either. They were a couple who were past their prime, and they had no children. They had no fertility left in their bodies. They had no hope of descendants. And in the ancient world, that was a terrible thing to go through. It's terrible in our modern world, but they put such a huge priority on that in the ancient world. This couple bore public shame over their lack of fertility. But God intervened. He came to them in their old age and past their prime, and he gave them his word, a promise, that they would bear a child together. It would be a child of their own making and of God's making. He would give them this miracle, and they would have descendants, not just one, but a whole nation, nations from them. And their descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore, if indeed you could count them, Abraham and Sarah, Well, they finally had a lot to look forward to after a long time of living through their struggles. I wonder about our struggles and exactly how long they're going to persist. I wonder how long we're going to have to put up with our current crises, how long we're going to have to live through certain things. I think it's important to hear the words of the prophets to the people who are in exile and remember they are words for us as well. Remember what the prophet Jeremiah had to say to those exiles of Israel who lived off in Babylonia during their crisis and exile? He said, There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. Jeremiah was echoing what Isaiah prophesied. He was telling them that there would be a future generation of these people who were off in exile who would get to come back home. You see, the Israelites had been taken away. Their country dismantled, their city, their holy city, Jerusalem, and their temple torn apart. And the people, the remnant of them, whatever was left was off in this exile land, a foreign land, a place that didn't look like anything familiar to them. And God gave them a promise through Isaiah, through Jeremiah, and other prophets too, that there would be a return. He gave them hope. And Isaiah's message for us today, this message of hope from the prophet Isaiah, is one about looking to the rock from which he had been hewn, looking back to Abraham, and seeing that if God could give hope to Abraham and Sarah, he could give hope to you as well. I think the Israelites' saga in Babylon has a lot of lessons that we can learn for us as Christians, as Americans, as humans in 2020. We need hope like the Israelites needed hope. I'll share with you a message from one of the district presidents of our church body, a man named Michael Newman. He's the Texas district president. He spoke actually a couple years ago at the Northwest District Convention. I got to hear him and Uh, And he used an example of a pastor who had gone out planting churches, and that pastor was Ed Daring. He was the church planter of St. John Lutheran Church about 110 years ago, who went out into a mission field and spread the good news of Jesus with great zeal. It was difficult work. It was hard work, but he and others like him went out because it was in the DNA of our church body to be zealous for mission to spread the good news of Jesus and plant churches. Well, Michael Newman had this interview that I saw online this week where he got to talk with, uh, with a man about 
what the Missouri Synod churches are going through today and how that compares to what Missouri Synod churches went through back in the 1918 pandemic, the Spanish flu. And Newman points out that in 1918, 675,000 people died in the United States from that flu pandemic. And there were probably 50 to 200 million people worldwide who died. Couple that with the World War I, the first mechanized war, and our church has sent 4,000 young men into war, never to return again. It was a tough time, he says. Now, when Michael was asked, every church leader you and I know today is trying to figure out how best to lead through the current pandemic, what did they do back then? Michael said, it created the first pause since our early beginnings in this amazing missionary movement known as the LCMS. There were plenty of worry, anxiety, hopelessness, despair. Is the church at an end? We can't do what we did before. They had big questions. They wondered big things. When asked to say more about that pause that the LCMS had, its first pause in mission, Michael said, there's power in the gospel, right? We're tempted to forget that the gospel has power. We're founded on a pause. When Jesus was on the cross, there was darkness. The whole world paused. For three days, Jesus was sealed in the tomb. One big pause before Jesus rose from the dead. We are new creations, he says, who walk by faith. The gospel motivates. We walk in Christ's steps. When Peter, proud and boastful, said to Jesus, uh, I will not let you suffer or die like you suggest, Peter was told, get behind me. Let me take the lead. We don't need to operate by fear. Now that's a message that we need to hear today. We don't need to operate by fear. Michael points out that it's time to rise up there's so many humble, anonymous people. They might be stressed out, anxiety-filled, seeing the landscape falling apart. Remember, lift up your heads. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. God is using you. See your weakness and hopelessness as conditions that God uses to create a beautiful movement. You see, if you're feeling it, it means others are feeling it too. If I'm feeling hopelessness, it means that some of you are probably feeling it. If I'm feeling anxious, it means some of you are feeling anxious. If I'm feeling angry and upset, it means some of you are feeling that too. And, and it's not just us. It's other people out there too. It's your neighbors. It's, it's friends. It's family members. And, and we experience this even though we've got faith in Jesus. How much more would we experience if we didn't? We need to reach out to those neighbors and those friends. And those family members, ask them how they're doing and invite them to know Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is our great hope. We have a lesson about this chip off the old block. We have this good news about our God who intervened in the lives of Abraham and Sarah. He took a rock out of the quarry and he brought a nation from this one rock, Abraham. He chose Abraham, he chose Sarah, he chose their offspring, and he's chosen you and me as well. He chose the exiles who were off in Babylonia with so little hope, but he gave them a promise of return. You see, we are a people of hope. Hope ultimately in Christ but also hope in God's intervention in the present day. Now, I'm not going to stand here on camera and be like some TV preacher who tells you that if you just believe hard enough, everything's going to get better. And tell you if you just send enough in your offerings, your life is going to be hunky-dory. Persimmon and potpourri, I can't tell you that. I don't know that sort of thing. In fact, I have a feeling if somebody tells you that, they're probably lying through their teeth. And they have no reason to give you that message. But I will give you this message. Whether your problems persist or end, whether your family dysfunction grows and gets worse, 
or gets tidied up and better. Whether our schools open up and teachers and kids can return to the classroom in safety or not at all this year. Whether our church community gets to ditch the gym and come back to the sanctuary, ditch the cameras and come back into the house or not. Whether this candidate or that candidate is elected into the office of president for the United States, I know that our God is a God who intervenes. You see, he was a God who visited the exiles and gave them his word of promise. And his word ministered to them in their present circumstances, not just about their future, but it gave them hope to live on in their present day. And when they had hope to live on, their present time became purposeful. We have hope to live on. Ultimate hope, yes. But we also have this hope in a God who intervenes in the present day. He comes to us even now through his word and through his sacrament. And I hope you will find time to receive that gift. Our God loves to come to us in our darkness, in our corners, in our struggles, even in our hopelessness because he loves to restore hope. He's not far from you. He hasn't left your side. He's not against you. He is for you. He intends to instill in you a great hope for your future. Our God is the God who fills us with hope. Listen to Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And I'll leave you with this blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Hope realized in the end, but hope that is yours here even in the middle. God bless you with that hope. Amen. stars saved find their way at the sound of your great name all condemned feel no shame at the sound of your great name every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. All the world will praise your great name. Son of God and man you are
for our prayers today. We're going to invite you to pray in your own homes. I'm going to give you some prompts of people and, and uh, challenges in the world to pray over and, and give them over to God and ask his intervention. And uh, as I give you that prompt, we'll pause the video. You can pause the video at home and, uh, and have a time to pray. If you have family members around you, fantastic. Then uh, perhaps each of you takes a different turn. And again, like I said last week, uh, these prayers do not have to be long and complicated. They can be short and sweet. They could also be long and complicated. It just depends on your own devotional life and how it is that you communicate with God. There's no wrong way to do this, but, uh, uh, but we're going to take time now to pray. And our, our first prompt for our prayers is to pray for the schools that are reopening. Uh, many are reopening with virtual learning, uh, and uh, others, though, are, are, are giving it a shot to be together in person. Uh, many colleges are doing that. So we want to pray for our college students who have gone off to school. Uh, we also want to pray for all those who are sharing classrooms in confined spaces, uh, those living in dormitories. Um, but let's pray also for our, our local schools, um, both the private ones that are meeting in person and our public schools that are meeting remotely. Uh, that God would guide teachers and students and that somehow God would show his grace on our community in, in this uh, endeavor and, uh, and that children would grow and learn through this. We'll pause the video and let you pray. Let's also take time now to pray for our families in our church and for other families that you know as well. That the love of Jesus would reign and rule in our homes, that husbands and wives and parents and children would learn to forgive one another and actually follow Jesus as his disciples, do what he commanded us to do, to loose others from their sins, to forgive as we have been forgiven. Let's take a time now, pause your video and pray for our families. Our third prompt for prayer is to pray for those who are struggling with health concerns. Uh, we want to lift up Mike and Judy's son, Aaron, also Julie's daughter, Debbie, uh, many who have struggled with, uh, with COVID and uh, with other illnesses. We also want to lift up uh, Oli and Yvonne's great-grandson, Caleb, uh, and the health challenges that he has, and anybody else that you know of who could use God's help and intervention in their health uh, concerns. So let's take time, pause the video, and pray for these or any others. Our final prompt for our prayers today is going to be uh, for those who are going through election cycles. All of us as we watch on and hear candidates talk and, uh, and give their speeches and talk about one another and, and that somehow our hearts would be stilled in the middle of this, that we would trust in Jesus who is really head of every nation. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that we would receive his peace in the middle of this process and that God would guide these elections and that uh, a person that he can work through will, will come into office. Uh, um, let's pray for our nation and for its future. You can pause your video to pray. And now we'll pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. I invite you to join your voice with mine. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve your neighbors. Thanks be to God.
你。